Okay, I call the house order. And now I invite the Prime Minister over to the big class. Go, Prime Minister. has the right to defend for itself. It definitely has the right to have to take the preemptive strike when they are Same. facing the imminent threat from a very massive destruction nuclear weapons. We see today the, uh, we see the picture in our days the conflict of between Israel and Iran are laboring day and day. And Israel, this country which is really problematic, different from our liberal democracies serving as a kind of a spiritual state, really, really uh, 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 composing with weapons of huge, uh, massive construction need to be solved. And secondly, we, we think that the United States, when they are, when they are taking a, when, when they are facing the elections, will need to force them to take a stance and leverage the conflict to inter international level to have a quick end to that uh, in th this scenario. Actually, we think uh, our policy is really clear. We, uh, we allow Israel to build in, um, uh, Israel uh, nuclear facilities before the elections in the United States. What I'm going to prove to you today, why it is necessary to have this kind of preemptive right. In this point, I'm going to illustrate the nature of nuclear weapons and what kind of country Israel are and why it is necessary for Israel to have a, this kind of preemptive strike. And furthermore, I'm going to explain why general elections and US are also uh, further developed by my partner. First, we're talking about the nature of nuclear weapons. We see nuclear weapon, even though it is called a kind of weapon, it is not in the same, uh, in the same meaning of traditional weapons that you should use it to fight for a fight against your enemy. Because this kind of weapon, the massive destruction will not only destroy your enemy, it will destroy the earth, it will destroy the people living on that island permanently. We saw that it's a, a huge, uh, that is a huge threat, not only to the people living on that island, but also generations ge after generations of people living on that island. This is an extremely unhuman weapon that we don't want to see. The moment that you do a bombing on, nu on nuclear facilities in Iran is the moment where you destroy and like explode a bomb of nuclear weapons in Iran. The radiation and the environmental damages are going to be exclusive to Iran alone. So, we have to face this issue. Well, we are comparing the worst scenario. We are comparing what kind of damages uh, we don't want most. Well, if Iran, this kind of country, has the ability to send these kind of nuclear weapons to anywhere in this world, we don't know what kind of consequences we might face. Compared to this, bombing the nuclear facilities in Iran, we also have this kind of ability or this kind of uh, technology, um, some kind of advancement to control the destruction on a minimum level instead of exploding the whole earth, putting the whole human race at a stake. We think that would definitely have this kind of, uh, have this kind of interest to us that. Well, because, let's go directly this to my second argument, the speciality of Iran. This is a spiritual state which means that the leaders there are uh, leaders are spiritual leader they have different totally different calculations than other secular states for example death for other people we value life we value the citizens uh, uh, we think uh, we we think that the, the life is the most important thing that we government yeah. needs to take care of no for them death is a chance to go to heaven death is a chance for you to fulfill your lofty mission and fight for your own race for this group of people they have done anything possible any kind of possible destruction to achieve the goal that is why we say iran has this kind of sponsorship to terrorism which disturb the whole us to disturb the whole human race that is why we say we don't know where iran would uh, what kind of consequences will iran will take 
run, uh, uh, Mandy Negard already told us, officially declared, we will wipe out Israel on us. We don't know when this group of people, the spiritual leader, make this claim, and they have this kind of intention, have the ability, Man. and have different, total different calculations than other secular states. We don't know whether this person will follow the instruction of international rules, international laws. That is why we say what Israel, now? their country, they have a really extremely high possibility of under, uh, uh, of under threat, being totally distracted by the nuclear weapons. That is why we say when you're fa facing imminent threat from outside, facing strong massive destruction for your country, we think every country has the right to defend for itself. But if, yeah. even if or at the proposition, uh, opposition might ask, we don't know whether this group of people will definitely assure, will definitely send the, the, the nuclear weapon on your tongue. We say the moment when they are sending yeah. those nuclear weapons to your uh, land, it's too late. At least when we're trying to use this method to control the damage, control everything possible to our, uh, based on our own calculation, in the value of human life. So that is why we see we definitely have this necessity to have a preemptive strike for Israel. Thirdly, we are going to talk about the US, the general elections, why it is so, it has, it is so important. We see US, the, the, this country has different interest groups. Some, some groups favor the Muslim allies, uh, Israel more, they support Israel, uh, Israel more. Well, some other people, they favor Iran more. So we don't know which kind of group will generally support each other. Well, this kind of general elections, when they are happen, people's attention are drawn by this kind of welfare system, where their health care insurance will go. So people's attention are already diverted from the international arena to the domestic, uh, uh, so to the, the, the domestic uh, uh, level. Well, in this scenario, well, Israel and even the whole human race is at stake. We think that it's definitely high time to draw the attention back, to deliver the conflict to an international level, force the US to take the state and help, to, uh, help um, Israel and uh, Iran to solve the conflict in nowadays. What I told you, man, uh, Mr. Speaker, first, it's really necessary for, for the nature of nuclear weapons. It's not for, in the countries of Iran, mutual assured destruction, the, the rights of deter never exists as this kind of function. And this kind of high possibility of attack, high possibility of threat facing by Israel is totally justifiable for us to have preemptive strikes. And then, uh, for the, in the US general elections, we need level the conflict and in, uh, enhance the negotiation, enhance all the kind of problem solving. We're proud to prepare. Seven thirty-six. May I have to hear from the leader of the group? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, we believe that the most outrageous thing coming from the government side in today's debate that despite all of our efforts to end our war in terrorism, despite all of the efforts that Barack Obama did in taking troops out of Iraq and trying to take troops out of Afghanistan, the moment that they bomb and advocate and destroy the kind of incentive that Iran wants to advocate the most is the moment in where you prolong the war on terrorism, you prolong the casualties in society, and you prolong the idea that we want to bring peace and stability in today's international society. Therefore, we are very proud to oppose today's motion under our model. First of all, Mr. Speaker, we also believe that taking out Iranians' nuclear facilities could actually be a beneficial thing in today's society. But today's debate is about the methodology upon how we actually take out these yeah, nuclear yeah. weapons. We don't think that a proactive strike and actually directly unilaterally destroying everything that Iran actually has right now is the best method because obviously provocations are actually going to occur under the characterization that the government side has provided in today's debate. Therefore, we believe that there are many countries in the Arab nations, so, uh, so for example, Turkey and Qatar, 
Qatar that actually take a lot of initiatives to bring more peace and stability in the Arab countries right now, as they have wants to show a lot of active willingness to invade in places such as Syria. And therefore, we believe that these countries actually do have a very great incentive to actually stop the kind of era, like the uh, like nuclear facilities right now. We also believe that maybe increasing the kind of forceability of the IAEA is actually a method that we can actually prolong and actually bring more forceful means so that Iran can actually use these nuclear weapons or nuclear facilities for more peaceful means to bring more energy into their own country. But we also believe that nuclear weapons is something that we want to prevent in today's society. Fundamentally because of the fact that the moment that you bomb Iran is the moment where Iran is actually going to use their terrorist allies to actually bring more harm in today's society. Therefore, I'm going to bring to you two things coming from the leader of opposition. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about how Iran is actually related to many terrorist organizations and why that is a direct harm in today's society. And I'm also going to tell you, second of all, upon the burden that the Saudi government never proved, upon the, like, the exclusivity regarding the specific election date of the United States of America and why directly targeting something before that state is extremely harmful in today's society. Before I go on to that, I have one point of rebuttal. The rest of my rebuttals are going to be integrated in my own speech as I have a lot of stuff to say. The only point of rebuttal is regarding their mutually assured destruction. Because their idea is that if Iran actually, Iran actually wants to have like nuclear weapons based upon the idea that they want to counterbalance the kind of pressure coming from the United States of America and Israel. If, if like the very fact that if nuclear weapons actually did exist in Iran, or if Iran actually had allies that had nuclear weapons, such as China right now, as they're trying to do a lot of unilateral, you know, like bilateral trade, we believe that if they're actually mutually assured destruction, then obviously like Chinese government, if they are an ally with Iran, is actually going to protect and actually bring that power in that power balance with Within those two individual yeah. entities. And if that's the case, we don't necessarily think that there's a direct harm coming from the idea of taking up the nuclear uh, nuclear facilities of Iran, but it's a problem of methodology. So thank you, sir. Before I go on, I know, let's go directly into my own substantive, which is going to be, first of all, about how Iran is very related to many nuclear like, terrorist organizations. Mr. Speaker, as the government prime minister has characterized, we also concede to the fact that Iran actually has a lot of ties, say for Hezbollah, say for Hamas, because President Mohammed uh, uh, Ami Dajjal actually gave 40% of his government money to actually Hezbollah, so that Hezbollah can actually fund their terrorist organizations and actually fund their own ideas. But Mr. Speaker, the most important thing that you've got to recognize is that Iran has been advocating very greatly for their own nuclear power. They have been one of the biggest advocates. They ignored IAEA restrictions. They ignored most of the international yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if that's the case, we believe that if Iran's most prized possession is nuclear weapons and the moment that you take that out with unilateral strikes, that is the moment in where Iran is actually going to be far more pissed off and there's going to be far more repercussions at the end of the day. Because fundamentally, we believe that that is the moment in where Iran has a direct incentive to actually fund these terrorist organizations and actually go even more underground in the international society, not abiding by those international laws, fundamentally actually gaining a lot of momentum so that those terrorist organizations can directly strike against American citizens and against Israeli citizens. Sorry. If that's the case, we actually do that. It is very extremely hard to track down a terrorist organization and track down a terrorist attack, fundamentally because of the idea that we've seen a lot of case examples such as in Spain, such as in France, such as in Bulgaria, where there are a lot of terrorist organizations that actually attack those places, despite all of the checks and balances, despite all of the ideas that we want to prevent <laughs> terrorist like attacks from happening at the end of the day. If, it is a, if this debate has happened in a context where we cannot prevent terrorist organizations attacking, then we believe that those attacks are actually going to succeed, and Iran has a very big incentive to make them succeed, Mr. Speaker, and they're going to do everything in their power to actually re uh, like go against the idea of the United States of America and fundamentally. Before I go on, yes, sir. When problem happens in Libya, in Syria, international community can act. Now, the case why Iran has got so much power is basically because international community has been inactive and has been doing nothing. Okay. How are you solving the problems? The reason why uh, the international community was not doing anything was because it is such a delicate issue, because it's regarding nuclear weapons, because it is regarding weapons of mass destruction. That's why we need to take a step back and take this issue far more seriously and far more cautiously, Mr. Speaker. And let's go into the particular aim. My characterization of why before an election is actually far more provocative because we believe that the harms are directly going to lead not only to America but also to the international society. Mr. Speaker, I have three reasons why the Iranian government or the Iranian terrorist organizations have a direct incentive to actually provocate and attack the United States of America. First of all, because fundamentally, if Israel attacks like if Israel attacks like Iran, then fundamentally, because Israel is in very close ties with the United States of America, the Iranian government is also going to think that the United States of America is behind that attack. But second of all, because America has been the biggest 
advocate against the nuclear weapons of the Iranian government. If that's the case, then obviously if the nuclear weapons were destroyed by Israel, then obviously the United States of America is going to have something behind it. But third of all, and most importantly, because it is an election time, Mr. Speaker, it is an election time where change is actually coming, but that change is actually going to change shiftly and very provocatively in a case in where you're going to directly do these drastic actions. Why is this so harmful, Mr. Speaker? Because the elections and the end of ideas that Barack Obama was trying to advocate was the ideas against war, uh, was trying to end the war against terrorism. Barack Obama actually took all of his troops away from Iraq and is taking away all of his troops in Afghanistan by the year of 2015. The moment where a terrorist attack actually occurs in the United States of America is the moment where every single person in the United States of America wants to advocate for more war against the terrorism because they want to pay back against the casualties that occurred in the United States of America. If that's the case, then obviously the military budget of the United States of America, which was $50 billion in today's society, is actually going to increase and going to be more provocative and is actually going to not trickle down to the benefits that needs to go to the United States of American citizens. But even if that's the case, we believe that there are going to be far more casualties in the status quo because we believe that, that prolonged war against nuclear terrorism is something that is very bad. Why is that a far more badder case scenario compared to a scenario where Iran actually has nuclear weapons? Even if Iran has nuclear weapons, which we don't think that's the case, if you say that there is going to be a mutually assured destruction, then obviously Iran is not going to obviously use their nuclear weapons every single time. That we believe that the amount of casualties that occur in a scenario and where Iran has nuclear weapons is far more lesser compared to a prolonged war that is going to go for 10, 20 years in a war against terrorism. If that's the case, then we believe that casualties actually are far less on the side of opposition because there's far less provocation, there are far, far less people actually trying to go against the United States of America. And for all those reasons, for the lives of the people, we are very proud to oppose. Seven, two, five. May I call for the second speaker of opening the Ladies and gentlemen, the world is not ideal. When we're talking about such kind of international relations issue, we need to understand that every country is bound not only by their own ideal, but also bound by their own financial budget, bound by their own tangible interests that they see. So in this imperfect world, we saw a lot of problems, like we've just mentioned, that you as actually people do care about things like their health care, things like how to improve their economy, not really so much more about how they can care about ter war on terrorism. They even want to stop this war on terrorism, which is exactly the reason why Israel is feeling more and more vulnerable against a, such an eminent threat in Iran. We say that it's high time for us to readdress this issue, to bring the international community back onto the side of Israel, to be on the strong side, to eventually make sure that this problem can be solved, instead of this inaction that the opposition side is taking and is no, not going to solve the problem at all. The, the leader of opposition has been Where neglecting the very problem that my partner has been mentioning again and again. Iran is not a secular state in which fear of retribution is so much this reason that there will be mutually assured destruction that they don't want to throw a nuclear bomb onto Iran. Instead, Iran is a spiritual state where people do care about going to heaven, for example, about how they can pay to their God, for example. In that case, when their death is nothing to fear, when the whole population believes in their spiritual leader, when the president did say that they want to wipe Israel out of the earth, that's exactly the threat that we're coming. There's no mutually assured destruction at all. That's the starting point of our debate. Seeing such a regime, what should we do? Clearly, the opening opposition side told us that Turkey wants to act, that Qatar wants to act, that there are international community who wants to act. But there's another part of the story that we've also seen, that Iran has been demonstrating its own military power despite all these efforts. Yeah, yeah. Iran has been actually sending a number of military drills around its area, like onto the sea, cruising to show to every country that even if US come, we don't fear. So that's exactly the problem here. There is an inaction and there is an ineffectiveness of yeah. all this yeah. Turkey and Qatar negotiation because they can't really solve the problem that Israel and Iran are stuck in this religious like, like, like conflict that there's not that easy to negotiate. And yet the leader of opposition supported our point in saying that there's so much terrorist like, connection that 
like, like Iran has with different terrorist organizations and even in owning a, o, their, their own nuclear weapon, despite IAEA constantly want to check, despite international community constantly argue that Iran should actually like report to IAEA and the international community. They don't care. We say, okay, when we have problem like mass like weapons of mass destruction, when Iraq was having mass weapons of mass destruction, we did act. We did have coalition army going in, defuse all the potential threat. Why when it comes to this situation with Iran, international community, despite all these refusal for investigation, yeah. we're still not acting. We're still not doing anything. This is something that you need to respond to. You constantly say, this is such a delicate issue. We agree, everything is this delicate. Is but in this case, why? Okay, an invasion is very different from bombing the nuclear facilities of Iran. The moment that you bomb these facilities is the moment where Iran sees the direct provocation and incentive and the justification to protect their people by doing more preemptive strikes with terrorist strikes. But that's exactly the problem here. If we can destroy all the nuclear weapons, even if they fight back, there will be traditional weapon, there will be conventional weapon, there won't be such a massive scale of destruction like brought about by nuclear weapon. Ladies and gentlemen, what we are going to talk about in this debate is basically about what international community and those like and basically the agenda of US is why it is now the time that we need to force an agenda on the international community, to force people to act. That's exactly why I started my debate in saying that we need to, put, to pay attention to all the realistic issues that we face. When U.S. is facing an economy that is going down, when they are shrinking their own financial budget, when they have such a problem starting wars, they are not that much into war anymore. When U.S. sees oil as very important strategic resource, and when there's much more importance in helping their Middle Eastern allies to produce more oil so that U.S. can benefit, there's even less of an incentive for U.S. to intervene. This is the same case for other international parties as well. When you talk about China, for example, we, we, we don't think China can actually help Iran because in that case, China is still having a strategic tie with the global economy, for example, between U.S. and with European countries. And China is also facing other problems, for example, surrounding China, like China-Japan issues. So that's when we don't see other international parties can go in and actually like help really solve the problem. Yet we see other international parties do have an incentive not going in, not dealing with these problems, stop acting. Eventually, this is the situation where Israel is stuck. We say there is a difference between the interests of Israel and the interests of international community. Ideally, we want international community, other good, responsible nations like U.S., like their other allies, to actually go in and help and really protect the interest of Israel, which is granted by the, their, their, like their, their sovereignty. But the question now is that if no countries can ever help Israel, Israel is stuck with um, like Muslim countries surrounding it, stuck with like Iran having nuclear bomb and threatening to throw the nuclear bomb on them. When is this going to end? Why our policy is going to make it much better so, ladies and gentlemen? This is exactly when there's election time. This is exactly when we need to go into this situation. If now the tension escalated, if now we destroy all the weapons, like, like most of the nuclear facilities in Iran, what happened is that we now raise this issue. It's not an unimportant issue to U.S. election anymore. It's not about purely competing on economy, purely competing on healthcare or whatever anymore. It's going to be about not only a competition between candidates on economy, but also on international relations. Clearly, U.S. cannot like re refuse to help their own allies because their own international relations, like their own foreign policy will be at stake and they have to stick to their own principles of protecting peace and that's when e like they can also urge their other allies once U.S. joined the force in going against Iran, in taking harsher actions, in supporting Israel, we are also forcing other international actors to go on the same line and to really start this process of solving the problem. In face of terrorists, we can't be stopped. And that's exactly the reason why we are losing this war today. We need to win this war tomorrow. Seven, Next question.
speaker. I thought that the whole point in why we created an international system of having the United Nations and having these different international organizations was unlike the World War II and World War I, so that we can actually uh, fight these kind of issues through negotiation here, here. and peaceful talks and like unit, uh, like multilateral talks instead of simply going to war any, every time a certain problem occur in the international society. Here, here. But clearly, the government side is actually trying to go back into the time of those kind of situations where we didn't have those kind of international organization. We clearly gave you the kind of context in today's debate in talking about why the status quo actually has the best kind of momentum to bring about those kind of changes in peaceful negotiations and those kind of multilateral talks here, in here. where countries like uh, Iraq and countries like Afghanistan are also being like these charts of the kind of uh, U.S. military troops that were in those nations and also the kind of war against terrorism that Bush so wanted to push is also decreasing and the kind of animosity in those kind of regions is also decreasing in that kind of momentum. Here, here. We think that the policy that the government is trying to push Madam. is only going to break that momentum and bring so much more animosity into this region of such fragile you know, international stability. It's going to break all those kind of things that we have worked so hard for. So we think that this debate is actually about showing on which side that um, international stability can better happen, in which side that regional stability can better be kept. So before moving on into my own sub substantive argument in clearly telling you why our side's policy is much better, I, I'm going to engage with the kind of ideas that came from the opening government. They were, the, the whole uh, you know, opening government's case was based on the idea that mutually, uh, the mutually, uh, this mutually assured destruction can never happen under their side. We first told you from Taeyong's speech that this kind of situation of mutually assured destruction is going to happen and can happen because we gave you the idea of nuclear umbrella, where even if these countries don't have the nuclear facility themselves, and how the situation of check and balance in their international era already gives you that kind of idea and gives you that kind of possibility where these countries actually have the system of mutually assured destruction. And we gave you the idea in how, like, uh, trade partners with Iran such as China and also other kind of allies in this kind of situations who want to create a check and balance system against the United States is also going to create and also going to contribute in creating the system of a somewhat indirect check and balance in this kind of nuclear system. So we told you that mutually assured destru destruction is actually going to happen. But then again, uh, even if under the premise that no mutually assured, like mutually assured destruction does not happen, we agree that the status quo where Iran has that kind of nuclear facility is actually quite dangerous and actually threatens that kind of international yeah, yeah. era. And that's the reason why we clearly told you in our stance that we also want that kind of international security. We also want those kind of regional stability. But the thing is, it's actually the question that we have to answer is what's the best way to actually achieve those kind of means at the end of the day. Here, here. We don't think it's necessary to actually get rid of those kind of nuclear weapons through bombing Iran. We think that's only going to cause more casualties. Here, here. It's only going to cause more harm. We think that the kind of idea that came from opening opposition in of trying to reach this kind of end by uh, peaceful purposes in talking about those kind of, you know, other kind of means of negotiation in those non-military measures is the way to go at the end of the day. We think that their side only causes more uh, animosity. We already gave you the kind of idea in creating a system where these uh, organizations like IAEA or countries like China is actually playing a role in this kind of situation in where we handle this kind of delicate issues in minimizing the harms in all of those international regions. So now I want to move into my own substantive uh, material in first uh, clearly labeling to you the kind of harms that's going to occur under their model. We first told you that the, kind, the first kind of harms that's going to occur is like the momentum of the international society is clearly going to be broken. So the international society is going for more negotiation, more peaceful talks, and more for those kind of economic sanctions and those kind of military you know, weapon and military bombing that the government wants to so go for, right? We think that when we actually carry out that kind of policy coming from government, those kind of international momentum and those kind of coalition for working that kind of uh, working for more peaceful talks is literally going to go down the drain, right? So that's the kind of thing that we worked for so hard in the kind of administration of Obama for more than like five years is all going to go down the drain. We think this is very, very meaningless. But second, we think it's also going to affect the kind of regional stability, regional instability in nations that surround uh, Iran. We think that countries like Iraq and countries like Afghanistan are also going to be provoked by this kind of happening in Iran. We think here, the kind here. of actions that the United States has been doing to these countries in withdrawing their troops in Afghanistan and withdrawing their troops in Iraq and creating the system of more stable democracy within Iraq is also going to go down the drain. We think it's like going to 
um, create this situation of instability, yeah. especially under the kind of idea that we told you, sit down, in where Iran is um, directly related to those kind of other terrorist organizations like Hezbollah. We think this is going to also indirectly, uh, also directly affect the kind of regional instability. But we also, we also tell you that this anger coming from Iran isn't only going to be pointed to Israel, but it's also going to be pointed to the United States. And we think this is harmful in that already the United States has had that kind of you know, situation of terrorism happening in the country. We think more casualties are not only going to occur in Israel, where you know, when these kind of, uh, when these kind of in Iranian terrorist organizations actually attack Israel, obviously the kind of citizens are going to be harmed. We think that the harm is also going to exist in Iran when they actually bomb the kind of nuclear weapon Clearly, the kind of innocent Iranian citizens are going to die from that kind of bombing. But this kind of harm is also going to you know, extend to the United States because the international society identifies the United States as a clear ally with Israel, right? We think this is going to be unfair even to the kind of citizens that live in the United States where they have done nothing wrong, but because of this kind of action done by Israel, those kind of United Nations citizens yeah. also have to be harmed. But we also told you that this kind of idea of the like budget and the election promises using for like le less for welfare, but more for the kind of actions for provocation and more for the kind of warfare that the United States is going for is also unfair to the kind of citizens that are within the United States. So we also tell you that in, in my second point of substantive material, the kind of international negotiations and non-military measures that we are trying to go for is actual, actually possible under our model. Because when you look at the kind of status quo, Iran actually depends heavily on the kind of economic trade that they have with the United States. They also it depend heavily on the kind of economic trade they have with China. Although the United States does not import the kind of oil from coming from Iran, they still import gasoline and petroleum coming from Iran. And by having those kind of economic sanctions, we can actually create an impact of $30 billion of the national you know, budget going to Iranian government. We think this is clearly going to you know, create some kind of incentive for the Iranian government to actually take the kind of measures. It's clearly going to create that kind of mandate within the Iranian government. We tell you that even if we, we carry out this kind of bomb, the problem like, essentially is not going to be solved. We think that it's only going to set the nuclear program being you know, carried out in the Iranian government for only for a few years, and they'll do it again. But we also tell you that these Iranian like, citizens, because of the kind of animosity they're going to have against the United States and against Israel, is only going to unite the kind of citizens for here the government. Here. This is going to create more animosity within the kind of, um, you know, within the kind of country, especially the kind of context that opening government gave us in the kind of religious state. We think it's going to create those kind of harms. We're very happy to oppose. So, Mr. Speaker, we believe that so far the opening house had a serious problem of really addressing the issue of two things. First of all, does USR have justification in this? But second of all, why before the US election, why is this period so important? So our foreign government will specifically deal with that, and this is going to be our unique contribution to the debate. But first of all, let's look at the opening opposition. Now, what was their stance and the Carter proposal? Let's say, oh, IA can do it. The international society, the UN can pressure it. We believe that their idealism fails on this sense because communication and these kind of talks only happen when one another wants something from one another. DPRK only goes into talks with six party talks when it's running out of economic resources when China is, is failing to support yeah, them. Yeah. So when uh, we believe that our uh, from closing government, okay, Iran has no incentive to talk with them in the status quo, and that's why we have terrorist attacks in the first place. That's why provocations, that's why we have wars happening in the first place, Mr. Speaker. So we're gonna bring them down to the same level and make them and force them to negotiate and we're gonna create more peaceful talks. Now let's talk about why IAE can be problematic. That's a current Sorry. Right? No, thank you, both of you. Uh, no, because IAEA is run by the first of all board of the uh, board of the IAEA, right? They have all the decision-making power. The P5 member states, which are the nuclear states, 
recognized by the NPT, all the people running it, which Iran is not part of. So they are not even in the context. So why are you saying that this uh, institution, which Iran isn't part of, can force them to do anything or make them do any changes? Because that's something that we have tried for last decade or so, right? So second argument, uh, first of all, the argument they bring about Iran relations to terrorist organizations, this kind of argument is saying that basically Iran has an incentive because they get really angry and say, you, terrorist group, go attack them, right? Well, first of all, we say that, like we'll say, and like we'll elaborate on constructive, when Iran has no incentive to talk, that's when these kind of things happen. The attacks on Spain, these kind of things happen because Iran knew that there was going to be no retribution towards the state. Why? Because it's holding the nuclear weapon system. Because it has these kind of asymmetrical weapons that Israel or the other Western powers cannot go against. But second, when they talk about other harm zones, for example, attack on U.S. will be targeted, so more like so, we just we lost, military loss. We believe that there are premise on attack on the USA force from the first place because of the uh, characterization mentioned by the opening government. These states are not secular states. These states are not liberal democracies. The leaders are the ones making the choice. So the calculus exists when it comes to going to wars, when it comes to affronting them, when it comes to these kind of attacks, which means that there is no jingoistic war anymore. Why have they not been engaging in wars ever since August War in 1980-something, right? Because of the fact that they have lost every single war, the Arab League and the Israel, against the Israel state. They know for a fact that they cannot win, and they, this is why they're only making provocations, and we'll only go to the extreme if you push them. We believe that this kind of justification, uh, we believe that this kind of calculus exists, which means that if you take out the nuclear weapon, which is their only source, which is their only source of really uh, taking the upper hand, then this, uh, then it will force the leaders to actually talk with them and peacefully uh, negotiate more, and all their harms fail under that rebuttal. No, thank you, not yet. Now, we have two extensions on this fact. Mr. Speaker, first of all, we'll provide specific justification on why we should do this. Uh, the open government said Iran is threatening them constantly with nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons is a threat to humanity after all. We are going to extend on this, saying that uh, we need to take a more just, a justified approach to this before the war, during the war, after the war. First of all, before the war, I'm going to talk about why this is a last resort. We see that Iran's past actions when there were constant wars, liberation wars, six-day war, August war, all starting by the Arab League, all starting with the headfront of Iran, is, is detrimental. It's showing that they are willing to be provocative as long as they know that they have an incentive to win, they have the possibility to win with their countries in mind. And they're now keeping the wars and peace treaties, constantly breaking them. The August war actually started on a very Thanks, national sir. holiday. And they did not, they're not forwarding any peace talks. And this is a more important thing, because this is something we want from both sides of the house, right? They're not coming to the negotiation table. Why? Because of the characterized nuclear facilities, again, a unique contribution comes from the government. We need to note, thank you. This is the part about during the war, why it's proportionally needed. There is a clear need for this, because let's talk about the nuclear weapons. <coughs> they are a threat to humanity. They can wipe out the entire world, whatever. But it's more than a weapon. We believe that, but it's more than a weapon. It's used as political leverage because it's an asymmetric force. When DPRK bombards, for example, South Korea, we don't actually make retribution against it. And DPRK knows that they have this calculus in mind, the leaders. And that's why they can attack it and get away from it. Because we know that they can't really do much, knowing that they have an asymmetric force on their side of the house. And also, there is a minimal harm in that. Going against their borders to directly confront whatever causes civilian deaths, causes a lot of um, a lot of hatred that they are going to talk about. But just specifically bombarding those facilities and taking them out, whether uh, with minimalized harm, minimalize this kind of hatred that they are so concerned Very about. Answer. That's why no, thank you. That's why, <laughs> sorry, that's why they do not come to negotiate. So how do you bring them? Which is going to be after the war. They have an upper hand, so they don't have any incentive to talk or no disincentive not to talk. So we're gonna create this. Once they get rid of this weapon, there's not it's not just a threat to humanity, but uh, which is not just a threat to humanity, but the levy there is stopping progress that the Iran has to do in the international arena, which is also what the opposition wants. Then you make more progress and more peace on our side of the house because now they don't have any asymmetric Sir. force. They can't just get away with these kind of provocations. <coughs> they can't get away with this kind of arctic okay. well, take, take mine. You think that the reason why China has that kind of incentive to you know try these kind of economic talks is because they also want the kind of stable resource of oil that they can only get from Iran. Yeah, exactly, which is going to be our second, thank you, second argument. Okay, so uh, moving on, make progress and make peace. 
more multinational tax, which is there so possible, will happen because they have an incentive to go there because now they have lost the diplomatic urge that puts them above them and not to the negotiation table. So why before US election, not just you know regarding election, regime change, but why specifically before election, again, a unique contribution. We believe that international policy in international, international justice is to be served what doesn't happen. Let's talk about Six Day War and August War. Obviously, in all those cases, Arab nations started the war. Israel had clear justification, but somebody pulled them off. It was always the USA because USA had the incentive because when the Arab leagues diplomatically pressured them with the economic powers of oil, which US is the biggest market to, then the US intervened saying that Israel is top right there. I know you're doing a just job, but we can't do it. We believe that these kind of power politics is not something that their side or our side is trying to support in this sense. The people using economic leverage to stop justified actions. We believe that before election, you, uh, the regime doesn't have much chance to uh, do this kind of actions when it comes to international politics because focus of Barack Obama and the current regime is specific on election campaigns because politicians don't really focus on these because the whole national focus on these and because there's no sustainable policy provided in the few months of time. So there will be no intervention from US, which is the biggest actor likely to pull Israel off from taking such actions of bombardment before, uh, so as to serving international justice, which their side of the house never reported to in the open government or the closing government. Uh, they it now. Okay, so we can forward opening government's case in that sense because now, after a leeway time, the US can now finally take a stance free from the economic, uh, economic pressure, free from the diplomatic pressure, that's unfairly changed the uh, distorted it in not taking justified action. So we believe the closing government takes on the debate. nuclear facilities in Iran, this will bring world peace. However, there, all, of their, all of their arguments are based on the assumption that all the nuclear weapons can be destroyed. That Israel would actually have the ability and have the intelligence information to destroy every nuclear facility in Iran. Now today, as a closing opposition, we will be bringing to you two extensions. Firstly, would all nuclear weapons really be destroyed? Does Israel really have the cap capability of de destroying them? And secondly, how Israel would, would actually lose support from the USA in the long term. Before I start, rebuttals first. Now today, government side has told us that they are forcing US to take a, to take a stance, to take a side before the election, because this would force the president to uh, support Israel. Well, we say that, yes, before the president election, the pre uh, USA would support Israel because of the great number of Jews uh, inside the country. However, we see that after the election, the government or the president would actually not have the incentive to support Israel again because of the forceful way, because of the threat that uh, Israel used to make sure that USA support them. Now, now, on my first point, would all nuclear weapons really be destroyed? Now today, we are saying that no, because Israel would actually not have enough intelligence information. And we are saying that US is smart enough not to provide them with intelligence information, even if they have that, because of um, fear of uh, losing support from its US citizens, which I will elaborate uh, in my later uh, extension. Now, we say that if these all, if not nuclear weapons are destroyed, it would actually fasten the pace of uh, Iran to further develop its nuclear weapons. Because we see that there are a lot of hidden facilities where we don't know they're underground. For example, take the example of North Korea. We see that a lot of these weapons cannot actually be detected, and they are uh, hide in a very confidential way, which is very hard. Mm -hmm. And so that is why we see that if we cannot fully detect and bomb all these nuclear weapons, it would actually fuel the anger of um, the Iran government. And we see, and this will actually provide them with um, a justification to protect their country. And by this, they would actually have a lot more retaliation, for example, developing faster um, their nuclear weapons. Or even if uh, they can, they would uh, be able to develop other kinds of weapons, for example, chemical weapons or other biological weapons. And so that is why we see that it is not a wise choice for us to develop it in this way. Yes. Yeah. 
Respond to our point. Why in Syria, Libya, in Iraq we can deal with it, in Iran we can't. Aren't you exactly saying that the more powerful and more evil a country gets, the more protected they get? No, we say that because today USA would not provide the in intelligence information they have. And only Israel, and only by Israel ability, they would not be able to um, uh, they would not be able to de detect all the underground information because of like their uh, incapability of IT and other stuff. And so we see that um, by uh, fueling the anger of the Iran government, this would actually cause a direct war confrontation, which we do not want to see, and which we do not want uh, this to affect the many efforts of peace that we have been negotiating for uh, the past many years. But we also see that, uh, and the government side just now has told us that there is no incentive for Iran to negotiate or to um, communicate with uh, other international countries. Sure. Let's say, but no, we say not, because there are a lot of in economic sanctions provided by the uh, opening opposition already. There are economic sanctions, there are embargoes, which would directly and uh, which would directly and devastatingly affect the economics of Iran. And so that is why we say that there is not entirely no incentive for uh, these Iran countries to actually talk. And we also see that world peace is an international trade. It's an international trend. And if Iran do not compel with this international trend, it would actually lead to more isolation in the world. And other countries or other um, um, uh, countries in the Middle East would not support that and would break down the already uh, beating up, uh, relationship between these two countries. And also we see the fact that break, the breakdown to relationship between US and uh, Israel is not a good thing. Why? Because Israel and USA have been cooperating for many years because of the fact that there are many Jews in Man, the USA. Sorry. And so that is why for so many years, USA has, a, has a, a provided, a uh, provided a protection to Israel. But without support from the USA, Israel would be more likely and more vulnerable to other Middle East countries. For example, Saudi Arabia were friends with Iraq, uh, with, with Israel, merely because they are both allies of USA. And from the recent example, uh, we see that Egypt and Saudi Arabia were once good friends because of USA, but because of the dictator that was taking down in Egypt, who uh, he was he was. Um, uh, a very good ally with US. But now because of the taking down of this ally, Egypt and Saudi Arabia has not such a good relationship as they had before. And so from this we see that without the support of USA, Israel would actually be more vulnerable and would um, be like, uh, not be, like, uh, be likely to uh, receive more at attacks or other um, forms of isolation from other countries. And so on my point on why um, uh, Israel would actually lose support from the USA in the long term, now firstly, because we all know that Israel bombing Iran nuclear facilities before the election is that they wanted to force the, force the president to take a side. They are actually forcing the government to support them because of the number of Jews and the number of votes that they have. And the effect to USA is that the world police image would actually be, breaking down, would be broken down because they are forced to uh, support Israel. However, it had, um, for, uh, however like for many years, uh, USA ha actually has, has an international status of arbitration of protecting world peace. And they cannot afford to lose this image merely because Israel is using a forceful way to force them to take a stance. So at the end, they would actually give up Israel and the relationship between USA and Israel would actually break down. And also we see that there is no support from US citizens. In the preemptive strike that we see in Iraq many years ago, led by the George Bush, Bush government, the George Bush government actually lose support from its citizens uh, because a lot of people disagree with this act. And so the, uh, the president would actually not care about Israel after the election because because of the uh, because they care more about its people and they care more about the democracy itself. And so that is why today we see that not all nuclear weapons would actually be destroyed under, um, uh, by Israel bombing Iran. And the fact that it would actually lose support from USA in the long term justifies that Israel should not bomb ir Iranian nuclear facilities. Thank you.
Break that mountain. Is that on? Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, it seems that all four teams in today's debate are going for one thing. Basically, regional stability, world peace, and whatnot. And from their attack regarding our met methodology, we concur for a fact that all sides are actually going for whether or not what's the best method to force Iran to its knees forced to get rid of their nuclear weapons, as well as create more peaceful grounds and get rid of their unfair political bargaining power regarding nuclear weapons. But in the case of the opposition, as the closing opposition mentions, before I go into anything else, they come up with the idea of practicality. Furthermore, they came up with the idea of losing support in the long run. We believe that this does not stand in today's debate regarding A, regarding the first argumentation of practicality. The motion clearly st states that you will do it if you can do it. The question is, if you do have the capability, will, your, will the choice making of Israel be to do it or not do it? We believe that this does not stand in today's debate when you're talking about whether or not you should do it in the case of possibilities. Number two, they talked about U.S.-Israel yeah. relations are breaking down as well as U.S.-Israel being more <coughs> vulnerable because they're losing support in the long term. When all four teams concur for a fact that either way, that the U.S., the international community, has a responsibility and will provide further actions against Iran, will provide further actions for the regional stability as well as for international stability and security, we believe this nonsense was in the end, in the end, this whether or not you lose support or not, that they yeah. will try to protect Israel yeah. or whatnot. not. Furthermore, as a unique contribution from the member of government, we claim to you that despite the U.S. being an international arbitrator regarding these conflicts, especially in the case of the Six-Day War, especially in the case of the August War, that they will be forced into taking more just measures instead of pulling back Israel when they try to take defense of themselves, when they try to promote self-defense, that in the end, you're actually promoting a more just world, especially in regarding the most influential power regarding the relationship between Israel and the rest of the Arab League, most prominently Iran. We believe their argument fails in the case because in the end, you don't have a choice when it comes to protecting regional stability. So let's go on to talk about what happened holistically in this debate and go on to the unique contributions of the closing government house. So what happened basically in the open half was they talked about the benefits and the harms coming out of this. Most importantly, the opening opposition basically came out and told you that momentum will be broken yeah, yeah. and that methodology is wrong yeah, and yeah, you had yeah. some weird harm regarding yeah. the U.S. budget and whatnot. Yes, sir. But we question, then what is your alternative? What kind of other methodology are you proposing except yeah. further sanctions, further talks, further negotiations? When A, the closing government came and talked about that the IAEA that has no jurisdiction over Iran for a fact is not part of the NPT. Furthermore, that talks, that negotiation, those sanctions have been going on for more than a decade. No religion there. there. No religion is there. Meaning that if you want to promote, you have to take another drastic measure in order to force down Iran on a seat regarding our first analysis regarding how we do have a justification regarding how this is the last resort, this is the last measure where you can minimize the harms. Yeah, yeah. Second, they talked about the U.S. budget, the U.S. welfare and the military's budget yeah. going up. Major assumption. Why in the hell would Iran try to attack the U.S. when A, Three as reasons. we said, the main, they have realistic measures against attacking the U.S. They have yeah. realistic measures against promoting terrorist groups to attack the U.S. because A, they've lost everywhere so far. <laughs> Two, because of the fact they can't do it on their own. So we believe that the, regarding the major assumption in the first place, why would they target the U.S. when the U.S. isn't the only ally of Israel, when you have other international standings backing Israel regarding their stance in the conflict between Israel and the Arab League. We believe their major assumptions does not stand. So, let's go on today's major clashes. So, the most important clash regarding justification. Second, regarding why, especially the elections. Mr. Speaker, first of all, regarding justification, we saw no clear injustice coming from <coughs> the opposition Point bench, sir. except for possible tangible harms. First, A, if you attack them, they'll be a nuclear meltdown, yeah, you'll be actually yeah. exploding nuclear bombs. Yeah, yeah. Two, regarding the fact that you'll have further attacks from yeah, yeah. other Hezbollah, whatnot, yeah, yeah. and whatnot. Please stop saying here, here. I think yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> but the question is, A, it doesn't happen. I think yeah, the yeah. main reason why we have such problems is because nobody actually clarified what nuclear facilities are. In two parts. First of all, nuclear facilities basically mean nuclear launching pads, where you have rockets, where you have nuclear Sir. warheads. Furthermore, all, all, also, 
those facilities that generate and produce nuclear weapons. A, as a motion stands, if you have the possibility, if you have the intel in order to attack us, whether you should do it or not. So regarding other possible retribution from Iran does not stand. Two, it doesn't happen because in the fact of a nuclear warhead, unless you activate it, it doesn't really explode as like boom, having another Hiroshima and Nagasaki going over it. So that harm fails. Second, the injustice, you say we actually minimize harms, they're pushing sanctions, they're pushing Iran to the brink where they have to actually retribute. We believe that actually directly attacking nuclear facilities, take away the major political bargaining power, to take away the major Period. major major warhead, the same as North Korea, why the international community doesn't touch it because they're not Period. sure whether they have it or not. I mean you take away <coughs> the greatest weapon, they're nothing. Mr. Speaker, we believe those Sorry. harms does not stand. Second, so why do we have justification? A, as they said, as we said in the closing government, one, you can actually minimize the harms going through the process, other extreme sanctions, other borderline conflicts, we can get away with it because we're actually minimizing the harms. We're only attacking these facilities which are quite protected, which are quite restricted, no civilian harms going from there. Two, you've already done so Wait, much. Sir. You've already done so much regarding how or why, what other sanctions you can take. Meaning that you already yeah, are right. justified because you have no other measure to resort to. Second, why especially elections? They claim, as the opening government and the closing government concurred, that this will actually force the U.S. into taking a more just measure. We're not knifing them in the sense that the U.S. is taking a laid back stance. Rather, what we're saying in the closing government in the contributory matter is that, A, because of the fact you're in an election time period, you can't really take immediate measures against Israel's attack, meaning you can't take the unjust stance even taken so far as keeping them away from taking a self-defensive measure. B, after elections are over, the U.S. has no choice but to step in and take a long side stance and actually support Israel in its own self-defense. Meaning that it, once you take away the major bargaining power, the major political card that Iran has so far, you have an easier measure addressing its actions, addressing its support of, of all these barbaric groups, first of all, addressing support of not, apply, not not conceding to all the other international treaties they have not conceded to so far. So, Mr. Speaker, Madam Judicator, and whatnot, sorry, you guys, if you actually <laughs> think that this methodology is the most proper way to actually resolve the conflict in the shortest time, the most efficient manner as possible, if it's for reasons of security, for international security, please vote for the closing government. Many of the we've got office. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, today uh, we, as a closing, have three main clashes. We see three main clashes in today's debate. Firstly, how would a strike actually play out in, t in that scenario? And secondly, what is the part? What it are the parties' reaction to such a strike? And thirdly, what is the international reaction to such a strike? Now, firstly, how would a strike actually play out? Now, my previous speaker have already told you that that there is a possibility that these strikes doesn't actually work. And although, and and even, and the point is, even if there the Israel have the capability of carrying out such a strike. My previous speaker have already told you very clearly it, Iran has other ways of attacking Israel. For example, other kinds of ma weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, other kinds of missiles that can directly attack Iran, that uh, is Israel. Now, and we're telling you also that within Israel's, I Israel itself, not everybody supports this such a strike, as my previous speaker have told you. Because even within the parliament of Israel, there's also a peace camp. And, and it's just that right now, the, um, the camp that, that advocates attacking Iran actively is in power. But what is democracy? Democracy means that you're considering the opinion of every single person in the country. And after this strike, we believe that this will severely even damage Israel itself. Because it, it, how can a democracy, how can they accommodate the needs of the peace camp when they um, unilaterally, the party unilaterally decides to attack Iran, Iran like that? So now, and then secondly, um, we also we also see that um, even if they have the capability to to attack Iran and destroy their nuclear weapon, we see that as they ask us, will Iran really fear? Will we, Iran will fear U.S. and not retaliate? But we're telling them no, because we are telling that Iran, as I've told you before, Iran has other weapons to attack Israel, and we're telling you that, as my previous told you, what is the actual situation here? Is that right now 
U.S. is forced to support Israel because it, he has the president has to uh, get the Jewish vote within the country. But after the election, East, uh, Europe, uh, Europe, Obama and uh, whichever president it is won't be forced to act as as before, and this would severely damage the long-term relationship between U.S. and Israel. And it is very likely that U U.S. might not support US Israel. So what? What is so Iran won't be, be concerning it? Oh, if, how? Why won't? Why will I? Why can't I attack uh, attack Israel because <coughs> of U.S. support? Sure. Because we're telling you that if it attacks uh, Israel, U.S. will very likely will mount, very likely not support it. And they tell us that okay, U.S. stance right now is very unjust, and we should change it. But we're telling you that what is just? What is just is that right now, what is the current situation? Is no, no country, no European country, no, not, not the United Nations, not, not a lot of Asian countries really support a preemptive strike. And we're telling you that what U.S. will be actually doing will be the unjust act of unilaterally deciding such a thing without Sir. thinking about the opposition from the international community. Now, to my second, uh, to my second class, what is the, what are the parties' reaction to such a strike? My previous speaker told you that the most important actor in this in this strike, the U.S.A.'s re reaction will be severely will be a very damaging. We're telling you that after this strike, the, the Israel will lose the support of the U.S.A. We're telling you that why? Sure. Because firstly, the U.S. will think it, that that Israel's act of forcing me to act with him is damaging our own world police image. Especially this image has been reconstructed af under the Obama's administration. Sure. We're telling you that a lot of European and Latin countries often seek um, U.S. as a me mediator in conflicts. For example, when there's an illegal coup in <coughs> Central America, they often find the U.S. to help them. But after this strike, they will believe that U.S. is not such a neutral mediator anymore and they won't ask U.S. for help. And this is damaging U.S. and which is why U.S. will not, will not want to help you Israel anymore. And secondly, we have told you about sure. the breakdown of relationship between sure. the USA and Israel because we're telling you even under the Obama administration and the, and then a few uh, a few months ago when the Jewish start encroachment of land on encroachment of Palestinian land, Obama really showed his the opposition to it. This shows that Obama and the U.S. president does have the capability to oppose Israel's issue, Israel's methods of, of policies or whatever. They they do have the power and the will the power to do it. Which is why we believe that after the election, the relationship will be severely damaged. And then, so sure. the, 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 and then being forcing the U.S. to act right now is not the correct correct way. And we're telling you also as a as a closing that. There's a domestic backlash in the U.S. itself because nobody, after you see, see after you saw the Iraq, Iraq, Iraqi invasion, at the invasion of Iraq, we sure. see that no U.S. citizens any longer support such such a preemptive strike. And because, and we believe that if the U.S. president really does commit such a strike with Israel, they sure. will lose. They will lose. They will know that they will lose the the support of their own people. And then they, after they become the president, then they will surely not support Israel anymore. So now, and then, uh, yes. Yeah, it is exactly <coughs> other international parties have conflicting interests that Israel have the right to have preemptive strike in face of someone wants to wipe out you on the earth. Well, we're telling you that 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 the, 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 the wipe out the, that they, tell, they keep on telling us that Iran will wipe out wipe wipe out Israel if they get nuclear weapons. But we're telling that. They told us that the, the, the leaders of Iran are, super, are spiritual and really irrational, but we're telling them that no, that even within the, spirit, the leaders of Iran, they have some sort of rational mechanism, which is why they temporarily allowed the IADA to come into the country because they wanted something from the international community, which is why they temporarily did such a decision. If they were sure. entirely spiritually crazy, then they wouldn't have allowed the, even the, the IAEA, IAEA to come in even for a second. Now, and secondly, we believe that the public of Iran is not so spiritually crazy as they as they say. Sure. Because we're telling you that even within Iran, there are oppositions to the 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 policies of the government. We're telling you that we can see this very clear from Green Revolution, which is a revolution against the Iranian government by the people himself. So the people of Iran itself doesn't really support such a we won't really necessarily support such a policy at all. Now, we're telling you, and to, to my last part, what is the international reaction? We're telling you because the, the international community today has a very overlying principle. We can see this from its own international organizations like the UN. We can see it from its, its efforts in trying to cooperate with Azure, that it's peace, peace above all else, which is why there are so many institutions in today's world. We're telling you that this peace can only come from, if we, if it can only come into existence if we use diplomacy. We're telling you that that what they are doing, uh, suggesting preemptive strike, is damaging and is in, in con is contrary to UN spirit. But then the reper international repercussion after 
this preemptive strike is for the isolation of Israel. Even right now, a lot of European countries does not support Israel's attitude towards Palestinians. And we tell that even after this preemptive strike, the, this attitude will escalate, and then the other countries will further isolate um, Israel. Because we, uh, we can see this very clear from the U.S. U.S. previous invasion, unilateral invasion in Iraq, which caused it to have a gap between. U.S. and a lot of European countries itself, because not a lot of countries support its measure, measure, and then it, it acts unilaterally, which is why this was damaging to their to their um, to their um, relationship. So um, <coughs> we believe we, as a op closing opposition, believe that there should not be any preemptive strike. We believe that yes, there should be a right to self protection, but we believe that this self protection does not come into existence by using a preemptive strike. We believe that diplomacy actually does work. Thank you. There, I shake hand you.